Good evening, everyone. I'm Sarah Ogre, the Executive Director of Humanities New York. Thanks for attending tonight's program, Democracy and Public Health. Whether you're coming to us in person or you're streaming the event, I want to extend a warm welcome to you all. I'll start with a word about Humanities New York. We are a private 501c3 and the statewide partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Our mission is to apply the humanities to strengthen democratic society, and we do that through a variety of grants and direct programs. Any tax-exempt entity in New York State can apply for our different levels of grants, and our programs, in addition to talks like tonight's event, include the Post-Incarceration Humanities Partnership and also a book group style program called Reading and Discussion, where participants read a series of books on a given theme, and we support that. Uh, tonight's topic is part of an effort Humanities New York has been making throughout the pandemic to create opportunities for discussions about how we all experience public health in our different ways, and to link these uh, discussions to the public humanities as we see many overlapping concerns and methods between these two fields. We brought this insight even more into focus at the invitation of the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, who we happen to also thank for funding our democracy and public health work. Uh, as part of our initiative, we will, after this event, also be offering a series of micro-grants on the topic of democracy and public health, so watch for an invitation to apply, with New York City-based organizations being eligible for that. I would also like to thank the Center for the Humanities here at the CUNY Graduate Center for co-hosting this program, providing the beautiful space here at Elabash Recital Hall, particularly Kendra Sullivan, Rebecca Jacobs, and Samson Starkweather. I'd like to acknowledge the Humanities New York staff, some of whom you met on your way in, as most of them have had a hand in the project. And this project has been led by our Director of Programs, Adam Capitanio, if you'd like to wave. Uh, so next, it's my pleasure to introduce the two guests who will be in conversation tonight. Merlin Chaukunyan is the Donald Gemson Professor of Sociomedical Sciences at Columbia University. He is the author of a book called All Health Politics is Local, Community Battles for Medical Care and Environmental Health, published by the University of North Carolina Press last year. And he's working on a new book called Who Dies, which will be published by Norton. Merlin is also the principal investigator on toxicdocs.org, toxicdocs.org, an NSF-funded repository that uses novel data science methods to make available millions of previously secret documents on industrial poisons. He currently serves on an expert advisory committee for the Centers for Disease Control on Structural Racism. Selena Hsu is the Marilyn J. Gittel Chair in Urban Studies and a professor of political science at the City University of New York. Her work focuses on everyday struggles for collective governance, and she has served on New York City's Participatory Budgeting Steering Committee since it began in 2011. The book she's writing now is called Budget Justice, Racial Solidarities and Politics from Below, forthcoming from Princeton University Press. Her other publications include Streetwise for Book Smarts, Grassroots Organizing and Education Reform in the Bronx from Cornell University Press, and pieces in the New York Times Magazine, Harper's, N Plus One, and elsewhere. We will have time for audience questions tonight, so if you have a question, we just ask that you jot it down legibly on one of these index cards that we handed out, and then pass it to either end of the aisle where we'll pick it up for the speakers. And if you're watching via Zoom webinar, you can write your question in the Q&A function. Our ASL services are provided by Aaron Murray and Bram Weiser of Sign Nexus. Thank you very much. Now, please welcome Selena and Merlin. Thank you. 
Hello, everybody. Thank you so much to Humanities New York, to the Center for the Humanities, and, for all, and to all of you for being here. So I have to admit that when I got this invitation, I was thrilled, but I was a little bit intimidated because I, I thought, OK, you want us to talk about public health and democracy, that sounds like everything. Um, so first things first, um, I, I want us to define some terms. What do you think of, Merlin, and emphasize when you talk about public health? Yeah, no, um, that's a great question. I want to say, first off, it's great to be uh, here with uh, Selena. We have a I think we were talking about this a little earlier when we met. Uh, we had like the classic New York City problem where there's somebody who works on something very uh, adjacent to what you work on and you read them for many years and you never meet them for uh, the, uh, all those years. So it was great to get to know Selena over this month. And thank you, Humanities New York, uh, for putting this on and also all the labor that goes behind it, um, everything from the ASL sign interpretation to the simulcast to you know just making sure we got to the right room and stuff. Um, I was going to walk to another auditorium and someone said, no, come to this one. So, you know, a lot of stuff, um, big and small. Um, to Selena's question about what is public health, I tend to think of public health in three dimensions. So one is a narrow dimension, which is literally whatever the public health department is doing. And this is kind of a, a conception of public health that I think a lot of people learn um, when they're being trained. When I was learning, in, uh, when I was in public health school, I learned um, something called the basic six functions of public health, and I was asked to recite this, uh, these on exams. And these are things like uh, collecting uh, surveillance, uh, overseeing uh, infrastructure, particularly for uh, sanitation, um, uh, monitoring uh, disease outbreaks and acting and doing contact tracing, et cetera, uh, when, they, when they occur. Um, sometimes, particularly in the past 50 years, when we've seen a rise in chronic disease, heart disease, and that sort of thing, cancer, uh, trying to initiate um, some kind of preventative programs that uh, prevent people from um, getting sick in, in the first place. So there's kind of a, a narrow conception of public health. And I don't use that in a pejorative way. I just mean a vision of public health that says, this, these are the boundaries of public health, and this is the lane that we are going to stay in it. I think that vision of public health competes with another vision of public health, which I would call the holistic vision of public health. So this one, I think, acknowledges that this traditional basic six or you know, however many basic tenets of public health uh, you think there are, are very important, but it also sees public health as something beyond just the health department and beyond just formal institutions that are labeled health institutions. So this vision of public health, for example, sees, say, the political economy of nutrition, of food production, of agriculture as very important. We all know, seems obvious, but um, um, nutrition policy and health policy are often discussed um, apart uh, from one another. This vision of health would see transportation as an important public health issue. Uh, and it would encourage people in the transportation sector to not only map out bus routes based on cost and efficiency and the traditional kinds of metrics we think about when we're uh, doing bus routes, but to also think about um, health outcomes. And then, you know, this vision also, uh, and this is where I think uh, it makes some of my colleagues at the public health school um, sometimes uncomfortable. This vision also goes into politics, right? It sometimes uh, thinks about the ways that political policies or power differentials in our society uh, can, can, can affect health. And there is a global movement now called Health in All Policies, H-I-A-P, Health in All Policies, um, that is encouraging people in non-health sectors uh, to pay attention to the health ramifications of what they do. So to just use the, the pre two previous examples, to get people, say, in the USDA and the MTA here in New York to think about how their work actually has health implications beyond the particular domain they're accustomed to. And it also encourages people in public health not to silo themselves, but to see themselves as kind of part of a broader uh, sort of society. I think the health in all policies approach is best visualized with concentric circles. 
Um, there's a narrow kind of traditional conception of public health in the middle, and then there's people who want to connect um, um, public health to all these other spheres uh, in, in society, whether it's uh, working conditions, food, um, parks and recreation policy, housing, what have you. And then there's a third definition of, of public health, uh, which I think is just public health as a measure. Um, that is, how healthy is the population um, as a whole unit? Uh, I think often, um, in, particularly in the United States, when we say health, we think of an individual patient. Um, pu public health uh, also denotes that the patient is the larger society at large, and it generally looks at it in two dimensions. Um, the aggregate, you know, what is the life expectancy of the United States or Estonia or China or what have you, but also fractures uh, within. So is uh, life expectancy higher for one group in that society and another group, uh, is it lower, you know, what is A, B, and C, what do those uh, different lines on the chart uh, look like? Um, some people have started to use the term population health instead of public health uh, to refer to public health as a measure. I'm one of those people. I think it just makes more clear that public health, um, on one hand, is an enterprise, and then on the other hand, you have population health, which is an actual measure of how healthy or not a society is and what the internal fractures are. So that's how I think about the terms. Yeah. Okay, I already learned a lot. There, uh, there's a lot there, um, and so much came to mind as I was trying to think of examples with those different frames. So I suddenly thought about Hurricane Ida and 13 basement dwellers died during Hurricane Ida. That's housing policy that should be thought of as health policy regarding basements. It's like the movie Parasite rendered literal, and it's it's going to be more frequent with climate change. And I thought about, um, yeah, just transportation policy or thinking about trees. And I know that the greenest block uh, um, in New York competition, I think, is happening right now. And I thought of how I think it's Baltimore, some neighborhoods that tend to be lower income during heat waves, partly because of fewer trees, tend to be I think 30 degrees warmer than high income neighborhoods during heat waves. Um, and so that makes me think about, you talked about population health. One of the big challenges that comes up again and again in so many iterations is that of inequalities or disparities. Um, so how are the inequalities or disparities usually talked about and how do you think we should be talking about inequalities. Yeah, no, that's an excellent question too. Um, so I think when we talk about uh, racial health inequalities or disparities or inequities, whatever term you wanna use, and in the question and answer session, I can go over why sometimes there have been some battles over uh, these, these, these different terms. Um, I think the one thing you're trying to get at is non-randomness. Um, so you can look at a table and parse the population by, say, uh, any demographic category you choose, and you're likely to find out, uh, find some pretty stark patterns um, in who gets um, particular kinds of diseases, who develops certain kinds of health conditions, differences in life expectancy. You know, pick your outcome. Um, in the United States, uh, the uh, disparities of particular interests, um, at least in the past 10 or 15 years, I think, and certainly during COVID have been uh, racial health disparities. But the idea of that literature and that uh, line of inquiry is um, to, to make the point that these are not random. It is not just um, uh, happenstance that um, when you uh, split the pop stratify the population um, by these kinds of categories and you see one line is one up here and one line is in the middle and one line is um, below, that that is not random, that that is structured. I think that's one big thing um, that work is trying to, uh, to convey. 
you often in kind of colloquial discourse will hear people say things like, I really hope I don't have a heart attack before I'm 50, or I really hope I don't develop cancer before, you know, at some point in my life. I really hope blank. And the problem with that is um, the implicit understand, the implicit assumption um, behind I really hope blank is that all this stuff is just kind of a dice roll. And this literature is basically saying that it is um, not a dice roll. It's very much patterned and structured. Um, in terms of your question, though, uh, Selena, about uh, the second part, what does this, what does, what do these kinds of studies do well, but also what they they might do less well? I think they can be kind of redundant sometimes. So when I was in graduate school, it seemed like every week there would be another discussion on another racial disparity and they would be really kind of distressing things to uh, see. Um, but I started to notice it was the, kind of the same presentation over and over again, and the health outcome would sometimes be different. So one week we might look at asthma, uh, the next week we might look at, um, I don't know, cervical cancer or something like that. But um, the general pattern was basically the same. Sometimes they would play around with the racial group um, in question. But I didn't feel I was actually learning anything about why um, the why why the disparity was occurring. So it seemed often um, that it was supposed to be self-evident. I was supposed to look at a disparity and automatically um, have an explanation for why it occurred. Um, I think this was one uh, troubling feature of some of the COVID uh, disparities reporting early on. We all know that there were dashboards that you could go to run by the government or the Atlantic.com or uh, the New York Times or what have you that would show very, at least to me, depressing racial disparities, but not a lot of explanation for why they occurred. And I think that's very dangerous because there are all kinds of explanations that racist people have come up with in the past to explain um, um, those kinds of racial differentials when one is, is not provided. So how do you improve this? Um, I th there are two things that um, I, I think uh, could improve this kind of very important research. One is to actually graft it to place setting, place and setting and communities and neighborhoods. So um, in public health, there is uh, a, 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 there's a, a kind of quest for something called generalizability. So my colleagues at the public health school and I are always trying to come up with um, big relationships between A and B variable and X and Y outcome, and we want them to be as universally applicable as possible. And in recent years, I've come to think that a lot of this quest for universal principles that apply everywhere is a huge fallacy. Um, and I think you saw some of this in COVID. Um, when uh, the importance of place uh, was very, very pronounced, particularly at the start of the pandemic. Where you lived, what kind of COVID uh, policy you were under uh, dictated very much um, COVID outcomes and, and, and how COVID played out. Um, so we need a lot of this literature to be much more anchored in place, whether that's the state level, county, city, or even the neighborhood and the block. And the second, and this is very particular to the United States, um, inequality literature has to actually take into much better account work, where you work. So most of us spend, um, if not the majority of the day, close to the majority of the day working. And there are people who uh, spend more than 50% um, of their time in a workplace and are exposed to all um, the features of that workplace. And yet, workplace data is actually not well collected in the United States. Demographic data is. So just to go back to the COVID example, when you, if you are unfortunate enough, as many of our fellow New Yorkers were, to end up in an intensive care unit um, for COVID or something else, what are the normal things that are collected? Age, where you live, um, gender, race, the kind of demographic, you know, Census Bureau kind of stuff. You don't get asked where you work. And if you don't have that data, then people like me and others can't analyze the role of work in producing some of these inequalities. Um, so I'm very passionate about uh, uh, restoring work and making it central 
um, to the discussion on inequality, whether it's racial inequality or, or some other kind. That was really helpful because I was going to ask about thinking through the notion of place-based inequalities with a little bit more nuance. You mentioned asthma, and I immediately think, oh, the South Bronx is known as asthma alley, et cetera. So there's definitely something to, to place, and, but by emphasizing work, we are led away from essentialist or biological sorts of guesses, like, oh, maybe there's something about how these people respond or people from, um, whether it's by age or by racial background, et cetera, there's a, the notion of really emphasizing work is a way of talking about place that, also, that brings in the built environment, our circumstances and experience more than exactly what the background variables are for each person. Absolutely, Selena. I think um, when a lot of public health people talk about place to the extent they even do, they are talking about your residence. Um, they are not talking about the place where uh, you often spend um, uh, the better part of your day. So you started to get at this a little bit regarding work and we remember um, those of us who were here during the pandemic, uh, the early days of the pandemic, the 7 p.m. applause, trying to shelter in place to the extent that we could. Um, folks who, and the applause started as um, help, as thank yous and gratitude for essential workers. And then I remember there was also mainstream, some mainstream debate about who, who um, belonged to this category and remembering food delivery workers, fo folks who were delivering groceries through DoorDash type or Instacart type um, services to elderly folks who took their jobs seriously because they knew that they were getting food to folks who wouldn't be able to get it otherwise, et cetera. But there was a, a lot of stuff happening. So what was the New York story of the pandemic to you now that we have a little bit of distance? Yeah, and that little bit of distance um, actually brought up a lot of emotional memories for me this week when I was kind of reflecting a little bit about the New York City experience. Um, I think, Steve, uh, could you put up the first slide of mine? Yeah, so um, I'm colorblind, by the way, but uh, I think that what I did was uh, make some of these uh, different kinds of lines, so I've got a Morse code line, a dash line, a straight line. Um, if you look at the, so these are two charts. Um, one is a New York City chart of, and these are COVID death rates. These are COVID death rates. Um, the first is a New York City chart, and the second is the nation at large. So this question of what phases New York City went through is a really fascinating one to me, and also um, what was New York, how was New York City similar, and how was it different um, from, from the, the nation at large. In many ways, New York was both exceptional and non-exceptional. So I'll start with the ways New York City was exceptional. Um, and it was exceptional in both great ways and really, I think, traumatic ways. Um, so I'll start with the traumatic ways. You can see just the magnitude of that first April 2020 spike. New York City got hit earliest and hardest by COVID, and that was not paralleled by any other um, kind of jurisdiction in the country throughout the pandemic. Um, you can see just how much bigger um, that April 2020 um, was relative to the size for the nation at large. But then you can see something kind of interesting, um, and this is where New York City was also exceptional, but not in a traumatic way, but in a good way. Um, you can see that in July of 2020, between July of 2020 to, I don't know, around uh, November 2020, I'll just jump up and down here, like, like around here, right? Look at the top graph. It's pretty flat. So there, New York City, my epidemiologist colleague Jeffrey Shaman um, 
characterized the early New York City response, and I mean March in 2020, as dithering. But after that, both New York City and New York State, um, through the Pause Act uh, issued by the former governor and also um, um, some edicts issued uh, in, in the city, um, did really well that summer, um, while the rest of the country was kind of fumbling um, along. So that's a kind of second um, sort of New York City exceptionalism there. I think the exceptionalism starts to end in, you know, you got three big episodes that I've highlighted there. Um, the first was a winter surge in January of, in December 2020, January 2021, winter 2020, I guess, um, uh, uh, that you see both in the nation at large, but also in New York. Um, and then, of course, the Delta and uh, Omicron um, spikes, and it was Delta a little better for New York City, but not Omicron. So what do I make of that? Um, it's been really hard for me because I'm a local politics guy, and I think local politics are hugely important, but I think as the pandemic has gone on, as the virus itself has become more contagious, as there has become psychological fatigue with adhering to mask wearing orders or limiting social activity, et cetera. Um, one particular jurisdiction's COVID policy, regardless of how robust or not it is, starts to matter less. And so you can basically see the New York story and the US story start to converge. I spent a lot of time in the first two years tracking different kinds of COVID policies in Iowa, in New York, in you know, Seattle, in Texas, in Florida, trying to point out how different kinds of governance resulted in different kinds of uh, COVID spikes or lulls. And I found that exercise to become increasingly futile as the pandemic wore on and there was more and more um, convergence. Um, there's one story I like to tell, too, that um, I think hits this home pretty hard, um, and it has nothing to do with New York, but I think it's very applicable to why New York exceptionalism in a good sense started to matter less and less. So in the first year of the pandemic, I love to bring out the example of Kerala State in India. So those, for those who don't know, Kerala is a state in India that is known for extremely robust uh, social welfare policies and a tradition of uh, strong labor rights and, um, and a robust kind of public health, uh, health state. And if you list all the things that you thought officials, whether in New York City or other parts of the United States were doing wrong, Kerala was doing it right. It was easy to get testing in Kerala. There was door-to-door -door type of community organizing sorts of methods, telling people about the virus and what to do if they got sick and what to do to prevent it. All kinds of stuff that if you read about it, you're like, why can Kerala do it and why, can, uh, why can't the United States? And in the first year, if you looked at the rates, the COVID rates in Kerala, you saw the Kerala strategy of this kind of uh, this strong uh, public health state pay off. Not a lot of deaths, not a lot of cases, not a lot of hospitalizations in Kerala. And then suddenly, boom. It's kind of like the New York lull and then boom. So what happened? It turns out Kerala is also a site where migrant workers from around the world have to pass through. And so those migrant workers were likely um, bringing the virus in and out of Kerala. And so because Kerala was connected to the larger world by this, uh, this source of, by, by, by this role in kind of a, labor, in a global labor market, it couldn't insulate itself um, uh, ultimately, and it kind of converged and became like everybody else. So that's kind of where I see it now. Um, I want, you know, and it's, it's left me a little flummoxed. Uh. So I have a couple of other questions, but I also want to ask about this. What was, do you have, do you know, 
I mean, the Hispanic Latinx line for, for winter 2020, 2021 is just really upsetting to see. Yeah, um, uh, I was, so the, the um, instead of just putting a single line for the entire population, I've instead divided the line by racial groups. And you can see um, um, the patterns in disparities um, uh, o o o over time. Um, I think there are two things you can uh, uh, draw from that. And um, the second thing I'll address in just a second, um, Selena. The first thing is uh, that during surges, uh, when um, COVID really spikes, you see the disparities uh, start to widen. And I think what that means is um, during a uh, time of particular contagiousness, it is um, those who are often um, on, the, on, the, on, the, on, on the most marginalized sides of society, they get hit um, the hardest. I think the Latinx disparity has actually not been talked about enough. Um, as you say, Selena, as you point out, it is actually the largest COVID disparity. Um, a number of a couple colleagues and I actually went through all the literature and data on COVID and race, and this actually really um, surprised us, but it also didn't surprise us based on what we know about uh, uh, low-wage service workers and COVID. And to that, I was wondering if, um, Steve, if you could put up this uh, second slide here. So in this uh, kind of, I guess, study we were doing on um, COVID, COVID and race, one of the things we were astonished by is like if you type race and COVID into any of these kinds of databases, you get thousands of articles, like it's too much to manage. You get enough articles to fit on my hand and that's it on work, race, and COVID. I was thinking about the meat packing plants. Yes, you don't, the best stuff we have on meat packing plants is actually not you know, state-of-the-art epidemiology, it's just really good reporting by ProPublica and those kinds of sources. There were two articles, though, that I think are the two most important articles that were published on COVID. So when people ask me, what are the two most important things? It's not the rarefied virology stuff as important as I think it is. It's these two articles because I think they tell a really profoundly sad story about society and the fact that there are two of maybe a half dozen such articles, I think tells another um, story. So let me just explain what this is. The first uh, article was published by a team of researchers at UCSF, which also included uh, Kirsten Babins Domingo, who is actually now the editor of the Journal of the American Medical Association. Um, and they looked at death certificates in California um, people who had died from COVID, and they tried to see whether or not um, the occupation that uh, uh, the people worked in um, ha might have some effect on elevated COVID deaths. And they found that if you worked in uh, industrial work, in manufacturing, in the food industry, in transportation, um, there was an elevated rate. So it, the way to read this is basically the higher the number is, the, the larger the number is compared to 1.0, the worse, the more excess. Um, so you can see I've highlighted some of these sectors there. Uh, and the, they also said that uh, the occupational disparities were particularly pronounced for particular racial groups. They were basically saying that if you really want to explain COVID racial death disparities, um, the best way to do that, or one, one big way to do that, was to look at where people work. To connect that to the question, Selena, about why the uh, Latinx uh, uh, disparity is so high, I believe we are looking not just at Latinx disparities, but Latinx low-wage service workers. Um, the second article, I think, is even more profound. So this article was published in Nature. One of the interesting things that has happened in COVID, which otherwise is a three-year depressing, awful 
period I think none of us really want to revisit in some ways, but one innovation that happened in uh, surveillance was the use of cell phone data to tell some pretty interesting um, stories. So this group of researchers took 98 million people's cell phone movements. You know, they kind of, you know, they looked at Merlin going back and forth or, you know, riding his bike or whatever for 98 uh, million people. And they also matched that with uh, COVID infectivity rates. And they found three things. You were more likely to get COVID if first you lived in um, a census tract that was low income, that had fewer whites, and then in terms of the mobility data, if you moved over and over again, back and forth to the same kind of route. And so they used this data to, sh to, to look at something even more interesting. It wasn't just the repeated routes, but it was where they were going. Because cell phone data is more and more precise now, you can actually track you know, where Merlin is going, what store is Merlin going to. And they found that um, in a number, they, they actually listed the, the establishments by rank order here um, in terms of, of elevated COVID infectivity level. Guess what the number one place was for COVID infectivity, full service restaurants. Who is going back and forth every day to a full service restaurant? Again, low wage service workers. You add on the income data, you add on the racial data, you have, um, I think, a, a, a story here about occupational health disparities um, and, by, 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 and, and how they're structured by the racialized way our economy works. Wow, so it feels like race and class together and labor are two of the big themes that you saw coming up again and again. Um, I was wondering if, if any main tensions or competing ideas came up that you saw, especially as the pandemic went on? Yeah, I mean, one was, I think, what we sort of discussed earlier, Selena, um, which is what is public health? Is it a narrow technical enterprise whose primary job is to collect data and then issue edicts on what people are supposed to do um, uh, from that data? Or is it a more uh, an enterprise that is aware about the ways uh, politics structures uh, how public health uh, plays out? There was a naivete, I think, among a lot of people in the public health profession who were puzzled when um, people didn't listen to them. And uh, they often didn't listen to them in incredibly antagonistic, vitriolic, uh, politicized ways. Um, so that is a tension. I was wondering if, Steve, you could go to the next slide. Um, I just thought that this was a Correct. little illustration of thinking about politics and thinking about this question you just raised. And here we have a placard during one of the marches for science um, that says, what do we want? Evidence-based policy. When do we want it? After peer review. And, um, and it's, as you just implied or stated outright, it's, it's not so simple. So what, what are your, some of your thoughts on that? Uh, it's definitely not so simple. I have this thing that I do in, in my public health class uh, that I teach to intro students, um, and I call it, what do I call it? Um, God, uh, well, I call it something. It's basically a fallacy. And the fallacy is this. Uh, I basically put up a chart and I say, oh yeah, I call it the founding story, the founding story, the founding myth that I think a lot of um, uh, people get when they're in public health school or uh, in adjacent disciplines. And I think is reflected on that placard. And it's, uh, you have a problem, so you study the problem, you use the best possible ev evidence and methods to ascertain why the problem is the way it is, and then you walk it over to a policymaker, and the policymaker says, ah, oh, thank God you came in here, 
and then uh, it translates the evidence into policy and voila, we have a light bulb and we celebrate evidence-based policy. I think this is, it is not caricature to say this is actually how lots of public health people before the pandemic thought. Um, so I think one of the greatest tensions that came up was the tension between experts and lay people. Um, and I don't just mean also the, the stuff that's easy to identify, you know, MAGA people in Huntington Beach uh, protesting and saying they didn't, uh, you know, they didn't want to wear masks or whatever. I mean, that's too easy. But um, there's also, I think, a larger crisis in confidence in public health. And I'll give you one example that actually really alarms me. Um, and it's around vaccination, but also a very specific part of around vac uh, part of uh, part of vaccination, um, a facet of vaccination. Um, and I'll use a state like California or New York that over time had pretty good vaccination rates for the two primary doses, those first ones, something like seventy to eighty percent. If you look at, however, the the rate for the third dose, the booster dose, and the fourth Omicron-specific bivalent dose, these numbers in places that otherwise had superb vaccine uptake are something like 20 to 30 percent. That means people have checked out or turned their backs on what public health people are telling them, and that concerns me uh, deeply. So I would say expert um, public tensions so let's keep talking about this a little bit. Um, could we go to the next slide, if that's all right? So this was a little matrix I made up, um, inspired by the New York Magazine highbrow, lowbrow, <laughs> bad, good matrix. This one, I was a little bit irreverent at first, but that's also sometimes in earnest just because I don't know what to do with my despair sometimes. But um, so here we have two examples that you just mentioned actually. On the, on the y-axis I put up, um, you know, policy, the y-axis represents public health expert approval in some ways. The ones in the top half are ones that public health experts say help to save lives. And then on the, the x-axis is sort of public approval. And so there's a few different things going on. Like for instance, in the lower right quadrant, you see Mothers Against Drunk Driving school assemblies, which are well-meaning, but according to official um, scientific studies, don't necessarily do that much, but probably perhaps communities want to do something about drunk driving and don't, I mean, I think this guessing and figuring out what the example, relevant examples are from our respective communities is already something to think about. Um, in the t ideally, we want more policies like the, pri like the first COVID vaccine in the top right some questions for me regarding democracy, perhaps, are why don't we have pop more public support for the policies in the upper left? Um, I know that Bloomberg's soda tax really did not have a lot of public support, and I don't know whether that's because they didn't adequately explain that soda companies are already subsidized. Maybe it should have been designed differently to reduce soda subsidies rather than make it feel like low income folks, individual consumers are the ones paying for it. I don't know what's, what's happening, but that's something for us to think about. And also something to think about is why some policies that have neither popular support nor public health expert support, such as continued lead paint not being abated in re residential buildings, or, you know, there was just another mass shooting with assault rifles this week, and over an overwhelming majority of Americans don't want at least assault rifles, even if there are other aspects that maybe are more contentious regarding gun control policy. What's the, 
What's the role of experts and expertise here for you? Yeah, a great question. Um, and I like this matrix a lot. It helps me think <laughs> through um, um, this trust issue. I think this is one of the, if you're looking for one of the big ticket questions, I think, um, that I think people should be studying, it's why don't people trust uh, experts? Um, I think there are a couple ways I've thought about this, uh, Selena. Um, I've been reading the work uh, in the past year or so of Phil Tetlock, uh, who is a, a Wharton professor and um, a guy who studies experts. Um, and he's mostly interested in foreign policy experts and um, their predictions. And um, But I think a lot of what he says is very applicable to the public health sphere, and I think it uh, I think experts would do good to take a page from Phil Tetlock. So I've been talking about Tetlock, but none of, many of you may not know what he says. So what does he say? So he's very famous for a finding that I think has um, somewhat been dis distorted a bit into kind of caricature. It's like the only thing they know. So he did a famous study where he found that if he took a pool of undergraduates and offered them free pizza and asked them to predict foreign policy developments, they did just as well as the actual foreign policy experts with, with PhDs. Now, Tetlock's point isn't that experts are all just a bunch of dummies and why don't we just uh, uh, delegate uh, foreign policy to undergrads because they just did as well in my experience. That's not what he's saying. But he is saying that experts often develop a posture that reduces uh, faith in them. So he says there are some things public experts can do um, to actually, it's not so much about whether they got something right or wrong, it's how they behave as um, more and more data about their predictions um, comes, into, comes into view. So they can do things like the following. One, if you're not an actual expert in a substance area, maybe sit a certain debate out. There ha we had a lot of people in public, in a lot of physicians who were credentialed in a lot of important difficult subfields but not infectious disease um, start uh, opining on, on, um, on things that they were not qualified uh, uh, to talk about um, in terms of inf the, the way infectious disease spread um, uh, and so forth. That's fine to do, but a second thing you should do when you're wrong is say, I was wrong and I was wrong for this reason, and um, this is my updated uh, prediction or view. But I didn't see a lot of that kind of humility from many of the experts. There were uh, uh, three particular health officials that I will single out um, as, as doing this. Um, Dave Shokchi, our former uh, health department um, uh, head, uh, Barbara Ferrer, uh, head of the Los Angeles uh, Department, and Fauci on, on most days. Um, but you see a lot of, you know, there's a lot of expert talking heads on TV who didn't do that, and I think that reduces um, trust. Um, I don't think it's great when people see uh, people who have two different people from fancy pants universities, um, and one of them says that it's safe to return for kids to return to school, and another one uh, says um, the opposite. Uh, this is uh, stuff that I think sows confusion, but also makes people uh, tune tune out after a while. What I hope for to your question about what is the role of experts, I hope in the, because my, my position is not experts are all dummies and let's just like crowdsource COVID policy. Dear God, no. But I would like to see experts in addition to adopting um, a posture of humility also convey that the intersection between science and policy is difficult and it is not a it is not wrong to say that. It is not wrong to say that often you have very imperfect data. You are making a decision on a very constricted uh, timetable. You may get better data that shows your previous decision might not have been the right one and you may have to course correct and tell people that. If we can convey that to the broader public, I think we can um, rehabilitate what I think is a very frayed relationship right now uh, between experts and the public. But I worry about this. I, I think even just of some personal experiences of how there were a lot of folks who were confused when 
when we were suddenly told, we were told for, for the first few weeks, don't wear masks, then wear masks, or under fives were not allowed vaccination until fairly recently, which was very, even after one of the vaccines became available, which was very difficult for a lot of folks, or, um, and also just questions of access. I have to admit that um, someone I know built a little software program that went to testing sites and clicked refresh for you um, when it was really hard to get a test. And I know that having a hacker friend is not evenly distributed amongst New York City <laughs> residents. Um, talk about income and other sorts of inequalities, but you know what, tests, masks, everything was at first really difficult to get or good information. Should I get a booster now before an important event or should I wait a little bit for the Omicron specific one? As you said, it wasn't just anti-maskers writ large who, who were having some, some doubts about our level of trust especially when it felt like, like the government failed to protect a lot of folks. And then I just read this week, I think, oh, you started cleaning a lot after, co after the co pandemic started? Well, most of those household products have d dangerous chemicals that are not allowed in many industrialized countries. Stop cleaning so much. There's, there's, there are reasons for folks to, to unfortunately be in the top left uh, quadrant instead of the top right quadrant. So, yeah. And that resources element, um, I think, is not discussed enough. It's not enough to just finger wag and say you need to wear a mask. I mean, sometimes it's as simple as procuring a mask um, can be uh, difficult or cost prohibitive, certainly at the uh, start for some, some people. So I'm very glad. I, I think that um, that part of the, you know, for future pandemics and future crises uh, certainly needs to be at the forefront from far more um, than it was here. I mean, the history of social services in the United States is often the history of middle-class professionals wagging their fingers at um, the people that they are uh, stewards of and wondering why they don't listen to them. And uh, there's still an element of that, um, I think, here. Yeah. So I have, a, um, I have a question about what would good governance look like to, uh, for you? Um, like what would good democratic public health decision making um, look like to you? Do you have one or two examples? Um, I do, and um, one is actually homegrown right here in, uh, in, in New York City. Uh, and when people get despondent um, about uh, public health, um, I always point um, to this particular movement. And it's actually two examples. Um, first is the environmental justice movement. So for those who don't know, uh, environmental justice is a movement that, you know, you can quibble about when it began, but it's basically uh, people who look at uh, toxic sites or toxic emissions, whether it's buses or incinerators or factories, and they started to notice that, huh, if you put these on a map, it seems like there are way more of these uh, 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 facilities in certain kinds of areas, uh, low income minority and sometimes low income and minority um, than in others. And so this is a movement that has been around for about 40 years or so, um, not only highlighting the disproportionate way uh, environmental health hazards are distributed, but also uh, fighting them and sometimes um, successfully. There is a group um, not far from where I work, actually, um, called West Harlem uh, Northern Manhattan Environmental Action, or WE ACT, WE ACT, uh, W-E-A-C-T, an incredible organization that I encourage people to uh, support and follow. WE ACT um, started in the 1990s as a grassroots organization. There were a bunch of people living in Washington Heights where there was an MTA bus depot uh, emitting at the time diesel fuel. 
diesel fuel, lots of research published on this, but all you need to know is very bad to be near diesel fuel, uh, especially in concentrated amounts and for long periods of time. The activists were also really annoyed that the research on um, asthma and the reasons people got asthma was very much concentrated on indoor air quality and particularly cockroaches. Now cockroaches are not good things, so you know I'm, they were glad people were studying them, but they were like, look, we live near this awful bus depot with these awful buses with these terrible diesel fumes. This is where it's at. And what they did was they actually went to my employer, which has, in most contexts, been a terrible neighbor to Washington Heights and um, Harlem. But they found a couple of allies in the Environmental Health Sciences Department. And they said, you know, we don't think the story is just cockroaches um, and, and indoor stuff as important as it is. We think it's this, but we can't really explore it to see if that, that hypothesis is true is true, can you help us? And to their credit, to their infinite credit, the environmental health sciences said, yes, we'll help you. And so what they did was they uh, took teenagers from Washington Heights, they outfitted them uh, with backpacks that had air monitoring uh, devices to them, and they, over the years, uh, compiled really you know, A plus quality research that showed that diesel fumes um, were concentrated in low income minority communities like Washington Heights, and B, that they had really bad uh, health effects. And WE ACT has been very persuasive in actually changing um, state and city policy on where these hazards uh, are, are located. I think this is an example. We've been talking about lay and expert clashes and lay people tuning out experts and experts not listening to lay people. This is a wonderful story about lay people and experts, and particularly lay people from grassroots organizations working together. And honestly, I can be as cynical as anybody in this room, and I've tried to find the cynicism here, and I can't really find it. So um, environmental justice is one. The second homegrown story is not too far from here. Um, uh, it's close to Cooper Union. So a lot of us have probably been to Cooper Union and we'd seen that marvelous uh, lecture hall in Cooper Union and all the famous people in history who have um, given speeches there. But it was also uh, uh, the meeting place for ACT UP New York, where they would have huge, raucous uh, meetings, decentralized meetings, and people with HIV and AIDS or people who are allies uh, of people with uh, HIV AIDS would get together and read medical articles together and actually learn, you know, the science of HIV AIDS and then they would push uh, people at the National Institutes of Health and the FDA and the Department of Health in uh, New York City to accelerate drug development, to allow women to take part in AIDS drug trials, uh, to expand the diagnostic criteria of AIDS so that certain people who are not thought, not diagnosed with AIDS could now be categorized as, as having AIDS. Another example of lay expert, not tension, although there was certainly a lot of it, and actually Fauci's an interesting guy here because he was often the target of ACT UP, but actually had enormous respect for a number of those ACT UP activists. But over time, a lot of lay expert cooperation there. So I don't think it's all bad uh, in terms of models uh, for community input, especially to the rarefied, you know, sometimes fortress-like worlds of public health and medicine. Um, I think that's uh, that sort of example is exactly why I'm so excited about this program in particular in facilitating further conversations about public health and um, democracy. I, I'll just quickly say that right now, this week, is... Um, is participatory budgeting vote week in New York City in 29 of the 51 city council districts. And that's a process where um, city council members give part of their budgets to everyday residents like us to vote to both give ideas, which happened a couple months ago, and now to vote on which ideas go through. And I have some critiques of this particular process in 
partly in how limited it is, but I'll say that it started in 1989 in Brazil, post-military dictatorship Brazil, where it immediately had a huge effect on infant mortality rates and lowered infant mortality rates, raised life expectancy. That, that is profound that there's something about a notion of what they call a techno-democracy rather than a techno-bureaucracy of using techno technical knowledge for the demo democratic good rather than in a way that just intimidates um, the larger public. And, um, and some of the ideas that um, are on the ballots right now, they're all very small. They're not like the ones in Brazil because of the size of budget to, devoted to this process. But they include fitness, I just looked them up this morning. They include fitness playgrounds in Prospect Park for elder, uh, for senior citizens, and they also, fa in their little meetings with their neighbors, realize, oh, we can make sure to in include equipment for folks with physical disabilities too. We, um, one, of the, one of the projects that just went through was totally developed by middle school students and it's menstruation justice. I would not have expected, and even maybe some DOE, Department of Education and Department of Health people would not have thought through like, oh, this is a priority for our middle school students, that they, they did the research, they talked to experts, they developed projects, and they got enough votes to fund this. Or um, um, another one that was striking to me was self-defense classes for Muslim women by Muslim women. And that's one example where I would not, I personally would not have been comfortable suggesting that for someone else. I know what you want, uh, I know what you need, but the fact that they, that community members themselves worked with experts to think about what works and develop these projects together is really moving to me. And I'll also say that a lot of countries around the world have used these sorts of people's assemblies for a lot of public health questions. Most famously, Ireland got people together to talk about really fraught issues like abortion, which in their constitution legally protected the life of a fetus over the life of the mother at some points. And it's fraught. There's no right answer and people got together and with in a room to talk about it with obstetricians and experts on hand to answer their questions and they listened to people from all across the political spectrum and they came together to write a constitutional amendment that sounded different from what they heard from pundits on the right or left, pro-life, pro-choice. It just sounded different when they were talking about real life experiences um, and gray areas. And by referendum, they, they changed the constitution. So um, there's, something to, there's something to expertise and there's something to public health. Okay, one minute. What, are you, what do you um, want us to leave with? Um, I think two, two things. Uh, the first is um, I've been thinking a lot about uh, when I showed that graph with the huge spike in April 2020, which was a larger rate of death than any place or time period subsequently, I thought a lot about public memory, collective memory, and forgetting. And that spike actually made me cry because I was like, wow, I, you know, I'm out and enjoying myself sort of again. And I forgot that, that bump and the people who are not just statistical aggregates represented by a, a very steep curve, but actual people um, represented by it. And I thought a lot about, um, what my mental process was and sort of just um, kind of, not, if not erasing that, pushing that to the back of my head.
And I think we do that a lot. So in 2005, when Hurricane Katrina happened and we all watched in horror, I remember saying to myself, you know, this is terrible and we have some terrible leaders in our country, but this is so bad, they're going to do things so this never happens again, something like this never happens again. And then the 15 years hence, um, it's been strange, but there's been a lot of things that um, unless I'm reminded of them, I found I've even forgotten. Hurricane Sandy, you all remember the BP oil spill? The worst oil spill in American history? It seems pretty distant, right? There was a coal ash spill in eastern Tennessee that was the worst coal ash spill, I think, in US history. Also something that has um, sort of strangely receded. Apocalyptic fires in California from climate change. And Australia, you remember the, those fires in Australia? I had to kind of dig them up from cobwebbed parts of, of my brain. So I hope with COVID that doesn't happen. And I hope that not just COVID, but we link them to these kinds of prior catastrophes that I think were really social indictments um, in, 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 in many ways. There's a quotation from the historian, the late historian Eric Hobsbawm that I always uh, put up for my students because I teach history of public health in a public health school and 90% of them are like, why do we have to learn this stuff? You know, we're here to learn how to count in sophisticated ways. So I put this, this quotation up. And Hobsbawm says, uh, the duty of the historian is to remind society of everything it would rather forget. And I hope that is what happens with uh, COVID. The second thing, very quickly, um, I hope uh, with COVID that when we talk about public health or population health, we don't think of it as a universal blob and entity, like you know a circle and everyone in it is equal. Um, I think those graphs that uh, uh, were up there and the, the fractures, Selena, uh, talked about, uh, I think, show we live in a very fractured society and that's manifested um, through in health and other dimensions as well. I'll use a, one example to show that of how I think we can um, think, think more on this. So you all may, may remember a, a figure called the r naught. It was this thing that uh, popped up on some people's phones. It was uh, an estimate of the average number of people somebody with COVID would uh, infect. Uh, and if it was greater than one, not good. If it was something like five or 10, uh-oh, that really meant COVID was really contagious. The problem with the R not number is that it sort of assumes that everybody in like New York City has the same level of disease burden and uh, is in the same sort of living and working conditions. And that is decidedly not true. So if I were to recalculate the R not for New York City and compare, say, the Upper East Side and Murray Hill to um, you know, Elmhurst and the South Bronx, you would get very different R naughts. Um, I think that's a very kind of technical uh, sort of measure, but I hope we start thinking of our world not as a single R naught, but as a bunch of different R naughts. I think that um, I wanted to just remind folks that you um, have index cards, and if you have any questions, to please pass them to your right um, so that we can maybe, um, if we have the chance in a couple minutes, um, answer at least some of them. Um, I guess my last um, point, maybe takeaway that I think of when I think of the pandemic is um, Arundhati Roy had this op-ed that sort of made the rounds towards the beginning of the pandemic that the pandemic is a portal. It could be a time, a crisis from which we emerge with a new world. And I'm just trying to, to um, think about, as you talk about forgetting, what remains with us, what I would like um, I think some of the mutual aid work that I saw, the networks, especially when they also had not just that, you know, they met their neighbors' needs, which is already quite important, but especially if they also helped folks to articulate their needs, 
to local government or to have the sorts of discussions that I was just referring to in civic assemblies. Um, the fact that we, you know, people didn't think that basic income, they thought that was such a crazy weird idea and then we got it for a little while. So um, what are, the, just, there were so many experiments that happened as we try to help each other survive, as we try to survive ourselves. Um, that's a question for me. And then one principle um, that captures some of it for me is the notion of targeted universalism that comes from someone, um, that as articulated by someone named John A. Powell. And, and one example of targeted universalism is what, targeted universalism is when you think of something that the most vulnerable among us need, and you give it to everybody. You make it universal. And one example is the curb cut that puts a ramp in the middle of a, uh, in the middle of a curb. It's for folks in wheelchairs, but parents with strollers or people taking grocery carts home or people who are just distracted and looking at their phone as they're walking down the street all benefit. There's so many examples of this where we pay attention to the miner's canary and then we try to change the mine rather than the canary. And we don't try to flee, we try to make it a better place. Um, yeah. So I'm excited for some questions. And then I. Thank you both. Um, I'm going to read us off some questions uh, from the audience. Um, one set of questions that folks have had um, is uh, going back to the points that um, you made, Merlin, about uh, more uh, a need for more um, data and studies on uh, the workplace in public health. Um, and uh, a couple folks have questions about um, if you could share a little bit more about where and how that um, data is being used in the public health field, and also relatedly about how um, if unionization or union demands have any effect on public health outcomes that you're aware of. Yeah, no, that's a, a fantastic question. Um, occupational health as a field was once a very vibrant field in the t uh, 20th century. And if you actually look at uh, when public health sort of took off as a field um, in the United States, um, one of the burgeoning points was in the early 20th century, and it was um, occupational health researchers who were studying the workplace. Um, who are a big part of the larger profession. With the decline in labor unions, really since I would say the 1960s or so, that has been paralleled by a decline in occupational health field, uh, occupational health as a field um, that people uh, who teach at institutions like mine um, can study. I did a count out of curiosity about, to just see how many people in my public health school listed occupational health as their chief interest um, in the entire public health school. The count was one. So that is how much it has dwindled. Um, so I think it's important to reverse that before we can make headway on why collecting occupational data uh, in a more systematic way is um, is uh, when, well, yeah before we can make more more progress on on that front. That um, first study I showed you with uh, the uh, occupational sectors and their relative uh, uh, death rates, they did so much work to get that data because it was not systematically collected at the hospital level. The way they did that was they actually went to the death certificates. And one by one, they coded every single death certificate uh, for COVID um, because California, by some fluke, happens to record jobs on death certificates. But we cannot have that be an outlier that needs to uh, be the norm. 
And I'd love to hear what Selena has to um, say on the union question or, or anything else. But yeah, I mean, if union decline and um, the broader decline of, of working people as a constituency um, is a reason for the marginalization of occupational health as a concern, I also think uh, the inverse is true. And I am really glad to see that in the past um, decade or so, we've had some real, uh, real traction in the labor movement in both um, more traditional places like teachers unions and the Chicago Teachers Union and uh, the Los Angeles uh, uh, staffers who just won after going on strike uh, for a couple of days out in LA, but also unusual uh, places. The number of NGOs that are trying to unionize or you know, Mar Marquis Condé Nast type publications I think shows uh, something really uh, uh, interesting um, going on. In terms of studies that show uh, whether or not labor unions improve people's health, so I'll take a somewhat contrarian view on that, which is I don't care what those studies say. Like, I think people have the right to, um, you know, as the Wagner Act states, they have the right to try to form a union if they want to and to try to collectively bargain full stop, and it doesn't matter whether or not there's a health improvement or not, although I suspect there would be for a variety of reasons, including the generations of research that show higher wages are very correlated with better health. And also, there have been studies showing that cities with higher unionization rates have higher wages for non-union workers in those cities also. There are spillover effects. There's something to the democratizing aspect of labor unions also. But I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a coincidence that some of the most um, dramatic unionization efforts, like the one at Amazon, um, happened partly because of COVID policies, and that there was, again, thinking about what we would like to keep from, from the pandemic, there was this blip where people weren't talking about exactly who is suffering, did they deserve this or not? They were focusing on the conditions rather than the exact profile of who got sick for a while. Um, and that, that's something that, that a lot of folks in the labor force were, were relating to. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, to your point on that last slide, Selena, about uplift, you know, it's, it's not exactly the same idea, but the idea that unionization benefits all and has these spillover effects, I think, very related to the idea of the last line. Thank you. Um, here's a couple of other sort of related questions. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how public health practitioners um, can move beyond just documenting health disparities into actually making change in um, alleviating those disparities? And um, similarly, uh, if there was a scenario where we could get to a point where the disparities were non-existent, where they were more or less the same for different demographic groups, um, what would you see as the sort of relationship between public health and um, democracy in that kind of situation? Wow, the last one is boom. Uh, I don't know if I can answer that one right away. I'll take a stab at it. Um, let me do the first one. I, I work in a public health school, and so I've spent some time thinking about um, both public practitioners in training and um, actual public health practitioners. I think public health needs to um, foreground, not solve, but foreground um, the definitional question that Selena led with, which is what is public health? Is this just going to be a technical enterprise or is this also a social change and a p political enterprise? I think um, for the person who asked that, um, some of your frustration with uh, some parts of public health is with people who view it as purely a technical enterprise and that's uh, all, it's going, uh, all it's going to be. 
And so that is why um, a number of people in public health are uncomfortable with um, teasing out the larger implications of their work and encouraging action on it. Um, public health is also uh, uh, structured in a way that I think people should know about. Um, it is largely funded, not exclusively, but largely by the federal government. And um, that federal government is uh, represented by uh, uh, you know, elected officials who have strong opinions on uh, what should and shouldn't be funded. For a very long time, although I'm glad to see this changing, um, a budding researcher would actually be told never ever mention the word climate change in your grant proposal, uh, regardless of whether or not uh, that's what you're actually uh, studying. So that's another force too, is um, you know, political currents that uh, I think have been interfering with um, the production of science as well. Um, the question of, yeah, if everything were equalized somehow uh, along uh, racial demographic lines, what does this mean for uh, public health and democracy. I mean, my first, this might be glib, but my first uh, response is, well, don't take your foot off the gas pedal. Uh, uh, you know, victories, I mean this seriously too. I mean, I'll take two examples, one that's a little more long-term and one that's a little more short-term. The long-term example is abortion, right? Uh, what I would call a major reproductive health and public health victory, but if you take your foot off uh, the gas pedal or you don't, um, um, fight as hard as certain other people, um, you know, you get, you see some pretty dire consequences. The other more recent one is, you know, I was remarking in like 2016, 2017, how awesome the progress was on trans rights in this country. And in many ways, uh, it is on a number of counts, not just, um, not just in terms of public policy, but the larger cultural sphere. Uh, I've never seen more tolerance and um, a spectrum of ways that uh, people, young and old, can um, express themselves and identify uh, and self-identify in a way that wasn't possible 20, even 10 years ago. It's also premature to declare victory, as we know, because there are some, there are some pretty dark you know, legislation going on in um, um, certain states. So just that's what I would say is to actually don't, don't take your foot off the gas pedal is in some ways glib, but it's also serious. <laughs> I'm not sure I have an original um, addendum to that, but just to say that technical knowledge is not neutral and it, and it's embedded in a certain landscape of power, as you said, regarding elected officials and funders. For, I think, four decades, you probably know the exact number, there was something called the Dickey Act that banned any congressionally funded research on deaths from gun violence. And so that, that's why the Guardian newspaper in the UK was collecting numbers from local newspaper accounts. Um, that is deep. So technical knowledge is neutral in some ways in that there's one and plus one equals two, but how it's used, what gets counted, it's always embedded in a certain political context. And and for it to serve democracy and serve communities, it has, there has to be a conversation be, between these public health experts and the communities that they're trying to really help that motivated their research in the first place. And there are dire consequences to that. I mean, it's still heartbreaking for me to learn that, and there, there were public health expert heroes, but thinking about Flint, Michigan, for instance, and the fact that General Motors apparently got a judge to allow them to not use the Flint River water for their car parts because it was corroding their car parts. And then they let people drink this water and it would have, and it saved them a hundred dollars a day. It saved the city a hundred dollars a day to um, to not mitigate what was going on in the Flint River. So 
So we are, we're doing this work in real places with real people. And, and there's something to strategic re uses of technical research. Thank you. I think we have time for maybe one final grouping of questions. Um, and uh, this is, um, these are all sort of related to ways in which the public health uh, community um, can um, respond to different problems. Um, Selena, you mentioned uh, the issue of um, gun violence. And is there a way that the public health community can um, make an intervention there? Um, and relatedly, uh, the, the notion that we've been talking about all night about um, sort of social and demographic determinants of health, which have become um, sort of funding issues du jour for um, the government and other uh, foundations and stuff like that. What are the ways that um, the public health community can um, continue to make those um, uh, a priority for funding institutions, and um, what is there a way that they can respond when um, those funding institutions kind of move on to uh, different, you know, topic du jour? Oh right, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go for it. Um, <laughs> Uh, the first question was about uh, used gun violence as an example and what can public health people do. Um, so I'll go back to the health and all policies formulation. The health and all policies formulation in its strictest, simplest sense is getting people in non-health domains to think about health. But I think the, uh, the, the opposite is true as well. More health people need to actually be thinking about domains outside of health, and that includes, um, there's no way around it, politics in a, both a small P sense and a capital P sense in terms of elected officials and, and so forth. Um, the, the people who are pro-gun are have been marvelous at uh, organizing themselves, um, electing people who are sympathetic to uh, their their agenda, um, getting uh, large swaths of the public on on their side, um, um, and people in public health, um, as Selena said, can't just think of tabulating uh, gun statistics as a purely technical enterprise. Um, they have to be willing to uh, step out of the public health lane too. Yeah, the second question about what do you do when um, you know the the trendiness of studying racial inequality uh, disappears and. Um, you know, how do you, how do you keep um, that, that momentum up? That's actually the most important uh, moment uh, for you to continue applying um, the sorts of pressure on foundations and um, um, public health agencies and so forth. Um, I don't know why I'm using this example, but I actually think it's a good one. So I have a friend who's um, like a stock market trader, day trader addict, and so he, uh, he says actually the key to good stock market investing isn't to jump in when everybody else is jumping into a stock. It's you jump in when no one cares about the stock, you get it low, and then um, at some point, uh, you know, it, it, go, it goes high again. I think there's an analogy to be uh, drawn between that and um, these kinds of issues because everybody gets interested in it when it's hot, but the key is actually to get interested in it when nobody thinks about it. And I think one way to do that is actually to develop, to actually take a community organizing approach within um, public health circles and to find peers um, who can who can apply that sort of pressure to organize to funding agencies and that sort of thing um, um, al along with you so I guess that's kind of my my first thought on that I'm not sure I have something um, concrete to add to that I was just going to say that research can also be a tool for mobilization and especially if you engage in the sorts of street science that you were talking about vis-a-vis 
we act and the different examples you gave, ideally, when we're in conversations with people, we get compelling, with real communities, we get compelling stories about what might be going awry soon before a disaster happens. Um, I mean, it's like the famous movies, like a civil action or Aaron Brockovich, those things happen after years of community members saying, hey, there's something going on. So there's something to, to the strength of building relationships so that you're on top of the research early on also. One final thing I'll add to that is I can always recognize a public health student's question. So I think that was a public health student's question. <laughs> um, don't just depend on public health schools and public health agencies uh, for exploring racial inequality. More often than not, um, they are not cue givers, they follow cues, and um, I think that's important to remember. Thank you, thank you both. Thank you so much, Selena and Merlin, and thank all of you for joining us this evening at Democracy and Public Health, and thank you for those thoughtful questions, students and otherwise. Uh, on behalf of the board and the staff of HNY, I want to congratulate you and uh, thank you again for leading this important discussion. Thanks again to the Center for the Humanities at CUNY Graduate School, and uh, thank you to the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation once again for making it possible and watch for the launch of the upcoming uh, conversation program based on this topic. We're grateful to you all for your support. Uh, please visit humanitiesny.org, like and follow, to make a donation in support of our work if you'd like, and please follow us on social media at humanitiesny. Thank you so much. <laughs>